Uh, by the way, I wanted to, I was just curious as a kind of very fairly generic question, just because you, as far as I understand, you grew up in Germany and then you studied in Leicester. That's right. Uh, so how, why psychology in Leicester kind of, or why England or, yeah. Yes. So um, I guess I was just quite driven early on. So I went to quite a competitive boarding school in Germany for the past three years of school. So I went to like a, well, for, for high achieving students, basically. So it was a selective school where I had to do entry exam to get in. I think after that, I just didn't want to go to just any kind of normal university and I wanted an extra challenge. And I also wanted to get a bit more, gain a bit more independence and, and freedom, I suppose. And another factor was that I really enjoy languages. So I've always um, been really into language learning and I really just wanted to get to grips with the English language, really. So, um, yeah, lots of different factors. I uh, had a close friend of mine who came from the UK initially. And he told me a bit about the UK, kind of UK university system, how you apply, because it's quite a different system from Germany. So I think that's what um, presents a key barrier to people actually exploring that as an option. And um, with his help, I looked at different options, basically, and then just got out a general university ranking. And well, I applied to different universities. Leicester was one of them. But Leicester was a bit of a not choice. I'd never heard of Leicester before. In, in Germany, actually, I think a lot of people don't even know how to pronounce it. Uh, so I get a lot of people who kind of yeah, yeah. try Leicester. Leicester. Leicester, that's a common yeah. one. <laughs> no, so for me, actually, it was a bit of a strategic um, geographical question because I didn't want to be right in London, but it's really expensive and really sort of busy. I wanted to be somewhere that's sort of in the middle, you know, where you can travel from quite easily, that you can get to quite easily. And obviously Leicester itself was quite renowned for psychology within the UK as well. So that was a main factor. So yeah, lots of different factors in there really. But I guess it was kind of curiosity, kind of developing sort of independence, uh, learning the language properly. Always liked English. So yeah, I haven't regretted it weirdly because uh, I wouldn't say that Leicester is the most exciting place to live in. <laughs> it's definitely not the most scenic a city of the UK. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I would say it's a very welcoming place, though. So it's a uh, multinational. It's uh, just really convenient and comfortable. So it's got everything that you need. But if you want a bit more excitement, then there's bigger cities around that you can travel to. And obviously, the university is a, is a quite a renowned, a very good one, especially in the area of psychology. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how. Uh... I guess to some extent we have like some overlap in the sense that I also grew up in Germany and studied in England. I guess for me it was just because my father's English I knew about the university system. Uh, but I agree. I mean, in the UK you have to apply a year before. In Germany you just kind of sign up three months That's or whatever right, yeah. before it. You have to be a lot more prepared. So by the time I even considered it, um, the applications for Oxbridge had already passed, for example. So, so some universities you have to apply for even earlier um, than the others. Uh, through the UCAS system. So it's, it's a very specific system, I guess. And it's, yeah, you have to be very prepared and know what you're doing. <laughs> and obviously tuition fees are a lot higher as well. So, Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, the other difference is I did go to London, which I, I think in I don't regret it, but in hindsight, it would have been smarter to go to a more affordable place because I'm not from a rich family. <laughs> yeah, same here. You know, <laughs> London can be a bit uh, restrictive if you don't have lots of money. Absolutely. And, and equally, I don't think I would have gone to the UK actually um, at this point in time where the tuition fees are even higher than they used to be. So when I studied in the UK, it was uh, £3,000 a year, which I thought was very high at the time. But now it's actually 9000 so it's tripled. And I think that's just a huge, it's really off-putting. Um, in addition to the whole Brexit situation, I think it's it's a huge issue. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether I would study in the UK now if I was, Probably I don't not. know. Yeah. But I was, so the, the very first thing you said really surprised me because having grown up in Germany myself, boarding schools aren't really a thing. No, they're not. And uh, so usually, and I, I know of one or two people who went to one, it was usually kind of topic specific. I know one guy who was really into music and then went to a kind of school that specialized on music and that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, so maybe for... I don't know, I guess every country has a different education system, but in Germany, you don't really have private schools. I mean, no, it's quite rare. So it's funny if I say that because my mother teaches at one. But <laughs> um, in Germany, we don't really have private schools, we don't really have boarding schools. That's um, true. So, yeah, maybe a bit more background on this. So, I'm um, from the federal state Hessen, and I think it was a bit of a pilot project of one of the, the previous. Um, federal state ministers really so they wanted to come up with a new way of promoting excellence in the federal state so they came up and um, I was actually the first year group for this particular boarding school it was quite an elite sort of selective process the idea was that it's still accessible to everybody so um, you didn't actually have to pay much for it you just had to pass quite a selective application procedure and um, yeah I think well I was the first year group um, taken in 2003 
And um, it was a special experience, obviously. So you said we don't have many boarding schools in Germany. I wasn't really sure what I was letting myself in for. Um, but it was a very, um, I don't know, it was a very quite a very important experience for my life because it really ch shaped the way that I sort of developed, obviously. So just being surrounded by fellow students for three years, really, and only having a few sort of weekends, um, every three weekends we go and visit home. And obviously with it being a selective elitist school, a school we um, had additional subjects, um, a larger curriculum. So I was learning Chinese, for example. We had um, Saturday school as well. So it just had a, a wider range of options. Um, we were sort of encouraged to participate in sort of international competitions and stuff. So there was a lot of extra training and extra um, teaching available. It was competitive <laughs> and it was tough, I would say, but it was also really a, a really useful opportunity to make really long-standing connections, I would say, and make really good friends. Okay. Boarding school also means like uh, kind of the stereotypical English example of a manor in the countryside <laughs> or was it, you know, there's like nothing else around. It's just a school or was it more? It was a bit like town, that or? actually. So <laughs> they found a, a little um, abandoned castle. <laughs> okay, it sounds really grand. It's not that grand, <laughs> like a little um, <laughs> nice little castle in, uh, you know, the Rheingau region near sort of, um, it's about an hour away from Frankfurt in a sort of, near i really don't know how to describe it but basically it was kind of surround, surrounded by kind of um a hilly landscape with lots of vineyards <laughs> you mean like the mines area a little bit a bit or... like that yeah exactly yeah okay so i think the idea was a bit that you were a bit separate <laughs> you know you had your kind of your little bubble um <laughs> yeah a lot of time to spend <laughs> studying <laughs> but you could also escape if you wanted to it wasn't that bad <laughs> and obviously yeah, people signed yeah. up for you know they 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 obviously wanted to be there. So <laughs> it was all very motivated students who'd undergone the selection procedures and really wanted to be there. So it's not like it was some sort of punishment that was sent away from home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Overall, it was a very um, positive experience, I would say. Okay, cool. Um, one uh, kind of last question just on the, before we get to actual science and topics and stuff. I saw you did a MSc in in, wait, what was it called? International studies, studies yeah. which sounds dubiously vague. And <laughs> <I know. laughs> uh, then you, I, I saw you worked for four years at an international organization, which also sounds very vague. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, what, what is international studies? Why yes. did you do that after psychology? And So I don't have your kind yeah. of very typical academic career, I would say. So I did, um, after my psychology degree, I just realized, you know how I said I was always very driven to kind of explore different cultures and languages and, and so on, I guess. That was always an interest of mine. And um, international studies was actually a politics degree, so international relations, that sort of thing. Um, so there were options to specialize within the program, which is why I think they kept the, the title of the program quite vague. So you could do kind of international relations, Middle East or European studies, whereas I kind of did the, the general master's, but I also added uh, Fran French studies to my degree. So basically, I was interested in um, international relations and international politics, international development, all that stuff, really. And um, I know a lot of people ask me, you know, that's quite different from psychology. But to me, it's really not. I think psychology plays a huge role in international politics. And um, well, I pursued that career for a little while. So that's why I moved to Brussels and I worked for different NGOs. So, for example, the UNPO, which is United. Um, I always get this wrong. Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization. <laughs> so it's basically a human rights organization that is lobbying um, European institutions like the European Parliament for more visibility to improve the rights and access of minority populations, such as, for example, the Uyghur population in Western um, China. So I worked with them for a bit. So um, all of that was kind of political lobbying. And it led to another opportunity in international development when I spent some time in Africa, actually. So after my, my time in Brussels, I moved to Western Africa to support a project by the German development organization, GIZ. I don't know whether you've heard of them, but basically they're the biggest German organization to um, conduct kind of development programs abroad. So for international, um, so for kind of developing countries that don't have the same sort of industry resources that we have, 
they conduct sort of development programs, for example, in the area of agriculture or in hygiene and sanitation. So they would go out to those countries and try to improve their livelihood by running certain programs to improve sustainability and so on. So I was there to support a project in the area of cashew nut farming, which is really random. And uh, I really don't have any background in agriculture, but I was there at a sort of political sort of organizational level supporting the project and just helping with communications. So again, that's where my language skills came in because I... Um, helped translating and, and communicating with media, for example. Um, so I spent some time in both Ghana and Benin. So Ghana is English-speaking and Benin is French-speaking, Western Africa, where I worked with them and uh, supported the project. After that, I moved back to their headquarters, GIZ headquarters in, in Frankfurt, near Frankfurt in Germany, worked, um, began in a sort of strategic organizational um, consultancy matter. So I, I supported the sort of Africa regional department in their um, grant acquisition and their kind of strategic, yeah, their kind of strategic positioning of their of their development projects and so on. But during t- that time, I realised, you know, I was uh, missing the search. <laughs> and uh, quite honestly, um, the main reason why I returned to academia is probably my PhD supervisor, Professor Andrew Coleman because I'd stayed in touch with him. He's based at the University of Leicester. I'd stayed in touch with him ever since my bachelor's degree, my first degree in the UK, because he thought my uh, undergraduate dissertation study was very outstanding and he wanted to publish the results. And we'd been working on this uh, and on this topic for a long period of time, always in the background while I was doing other things. And I just realised I really enjoyed it. And I had enough of some of the very bureaucratic structures that I encountered in GIZ and that very huge organization that was partly government funded. So public funding sometimes, you know, comes with certain bureaucratic procedures. And like universities. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> but yeah, I decided to return to academia to kind of leave my safe job where I was earning quite a good amount of money, you know, and uh, become a student again and do a PhD. And that's how I ended up back in the UK, back at Leicester doing a PhD. It's interesting to me that, I mean, you mentioned that international relations and politics can be very related to psychology. I mean, I guess especially game theory and those kind of studies are really intertwined with it is, I mean, was that also part of why you wanted to do research again also because it, it did relate to this like other stuff you were interested in or? absolutely i do think they're so interrelated it's all about kind of wider decision making basically political decision making it's hugely important and i just kept seeing the parallels really between game theory which is the area where it came from in research and sort of real life applications in politics so i think the two go hand in hand really and i just thought it'd be really interesting to dig a bit deeper to kind of get those foundational issues really straightened out yeah, and I guess, I mean, the, I think what we're spending the bulk of today's conversation on will be your work, your current work on antimicrobial resistance, which I guess, again, goes more towards the larger scale political... Exactly. Uh, I do a lot of policy work. So again, that kind of area comes back in. I think it's all overlapping. It all kind of matters. So um, a lot of people have asked me, like, you know, like I said, how does it, how does this go together? But I do think all of these areas kind of go really well together. Yeah, so I mean, uh, before we get to your current work, I just, uh, you know, wanted to ask a little bit about about the Centipede game, just because you did, um, from what I can tell, I, I downloaded your PhD thesis and read the abstract. You did. Um, <laughs> yeah. Excellent. That's so, more than most people would have done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I was also curious um, whether your thesis was actually on the Centipede game, because, you know, sometimes people have theses on slightly different topics than the papers they publish and that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess you did that. That's kind of what you spent your PhD time exactly. doing. Um, so maybe first, yeah, I'm just curious, what is the centipede game? And yeah, what, what's what's kind of the specific reason for using that versus a different game? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, it's a really good question. So a lot of people, so like you said, I really did spend my entire PhD focusing on that very, very game. And obviously I published from from the studies. Uh, a lot of people, when they first hear the centipede game, they think it's a worm, or like a biologist studying worms <laughs> and insects. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is not the case. <laughs> so the centipede game is uh, really a model, a decision model for reciprocal interactions. So kind of turn-taking and cooperative actions between two people, in some cases, potentially more than two people. So it models any kind of a situation where you have a relationship with another person and you kind of help each other out on regular occasions, kind of taking turns helping the other person, basically. And um, 
the question is really why these relationships are sustained because the, the theoretical model, the game theoretical model, suggests that it's actually not rational to uh, persist in relationships like this. I don't know how much you know about game theory or how much the, the listeners will know about it, but they're basically, um, they propose games as abstract models of interactive um, context, decision context. And I suppose a very famous game is the Prisoner's Dilemma game, where you can decide between cooperation and defection. And while cooperation benefits both people in the game, defection, single-sided defection can um, benefit the defector <laughs> at the cost of the other person. So um, the centipede game is a bit similar to this, actually. It just means rather than being a one-shot, a single interaction, it's actually repeated uh, across a, a series over time. So it does the one thing I was wondering about, um, does it have a like specific payoff structure? Because I guess you could you can have iterative prison dilemmas, you can have prison dilemmas where people take turns. Um, so I'm not entirely sure right now what the... Yeah, how it's exactly different from, let's say, an iterated prison dilemma. It's, it's they... similar to the iterated prison dilemma. The difference is that the um, payoffs actually increase over time. So basically, players have to decide you know, on each kind of occasion where they interact with one another. They have to decide between a cooperative move, which is a go move, and a non-cooperative move, which is a stop move. Now, the cooperative move go keeps the game going, whereas stop immediately ends the interaction. So again, an iterated a prison dilemma game you would probably just keep on playing games, whereas the stop move is quite a finite action and it basically limits um, the extent to which you're going to interact with one another. And then every go move actually also leads to, well, it depends on the particular payoff structure that we're looking at because there are different versions of the centipede game. But in a, in a common uh, version, the total payoff pot available to both players will actually double at, on each occasion that the person chooses go. So there's a really big incentive for the team to keep going in the game because as, as a collective they will earn a lot more money in the long run. Now the problem is though that making a go move, so by contributing to the team's payoff, you also slightly reduce your own payoff from the previous node. Even though you're benefiting the group overall, you're making a, a small sort of sacrifice which could obviously backfire if the person chooses, the next person chooses to stop at the next node. So there is a bit of a trade-off and a bit of a balancing action going on here. Do you kind of, um, and I guess that's the underlying uh, theme for all social dilemmas, which I'm interested in. You know, do you benefit the wider team, the pair of players, both of you in the long run, or do you go for your own kind of advantage and uh, play it safe and make sure that you don't sacrifice any of your own uh, payoff in the short run? How is it different from a trust game then? Because that's, I mean, I guess in trust game you have the option of returning, but it sounds like it can be. It's, yeah, it's similar again. Yeah, it's similar to a trust game. I think in the centipede game again, it's more um, that the payoffs are actually already fixed. So that the, in the trust game, you can sometimes decide how much you give back, basically. Whereas the the centipede game is is more structured over time. So it's quite a specific um, function, and it's always over more instances. So I think the trust game is usually just kind of two iterations or something so it won't actually right. continue whereas the centipede game i think that's what makes it really interesting to study as well it can continue for a long time and really if you have exponentially increasing payoffs there is an option to really earn a lot of money towards the end so i did uh, i did investigate certain games you know again you know they're varying payoff function but the ones that i looked at there was an option to earn up to 390 pounds if you really, you know, went along cooperating all the way, and that's a crazy amount of money for <laughs> mostly student participants. So I, I think it's just a really fascinating sort of context to be making a decision in. But sorry, why? It sounds to me like in this case, there's a very strong incentive to keep going, right? If you can, if it's an exponential increase. But it is, why but, but every go move also reduces uh, the own payoff at the next node. So if the, if the person... By how much? Again, that depends. Oh, yeah. it, it depends, yeah, yeah. but usually um, it's significant enough for people to worry. So, <laughs> it's, okay, I guess, yeah. yeah. So that's that's the whole point because you have to trust the other person to then keep continuing, because otherwise your your own move won't pay off individually. It will pay off for the team overall, but it mainly benefits the other person. I mean, so this game is not uh, a super new game, right? I think uh, I think in your thesis it said uh, 1981. I believe. Um, You've so, done your own work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I think, think, I think the one. important thing is... But I'm just... Yeah, I'm just what I wanted to get to is just like, what um, did you do kind of to that game? 
So interestingly, it was developed in 1981, but it was never really properly studied that much. And it, it was used in a lot of theoretical discussions because you can apply sort of, um, well, theoretical um, formulas or like reasoning, basically, such as backward induction reasoning, which is a, a common theme in game theory. So I think it attracted a lot of um, attention from your theoretical economists, but it was very r- rarely actually studied in the lab. So I think I would say that the bulk of the experimental studies on the game have probably been conducted by myself. <laughs> Not just by myself, no, that's okay. That was an overstatement, but a, a lot of the work, I've definitely contributed to the number of experimental studies on it. And I think I really wanted to see, you know, in addition to the theoretical arguments around cooperation or defection um, that come from the backward induction logic, I wanted to see what psychology can offer. So I looked at specific variables and factors that might influence behavior in the game and uh, specifically social value orientation, which is a very common concept, kind of measuring how much people are willing to um, give to others, basically. So how, how their kind of, how their preferences lie when it comes to the distribution of resources. And um, I did find that, well, maybe not that surprisingly, but altruists and cooperative people who are very happy to, to share with the team tend to cooperate uh, for much longer in the centipede game. So um, there are definitely, so basically I proved that there were certain psychological variables that really played a role and that it's not just all about uh, economic rational reasoning that determines behavior. Is, um, I'm curious because you said like it's it's not been studied all that much. Do, do you think it's a good game? Like, is it a game that should be studied more? Um, or is it, does it, I don't know, is it maybe too similar to other games or is it, yeah, like why hasn't it been studied more? I guess maybe that's part of the question. I don't know why it hasn't been studied more. I do think it deserves more attention because there's a lot of um, potential to vary the payoff function in really interesting ways. And I've done that in some studies and it just shows that even small variations can have huge effects. It's really fascinating to see. And I believe it is more interesting because it allows for those kind of exponential increases that really um, lead to a massive increase in the potential payoffs to be earned. And it's just very surprising that I, th- I think it's a stark kind of contrast between the theoretical predictions that people shouldn't cooperate at all and then, you know, the, the actual really high incentives that are to be gained. That is just really counterintuitive, I think, and that's what makes it so interesting to study for me. So I do think it deserves more attention. I think it was possibly overlooked because it was mainly, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> mainly just studied by the economists. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is the weird th- the thing that I find really weird uh, in, I guess it's probably in most research areas, but in especially some of the game theory stuff, um, that I feel like a lot of the, you know, it, it feels like there's this research literature that's existed for like 50 years from economists, psychologists, evolution biologists, and and other people. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's this, all these disciplines studying this thing, and yet there are so many of the very basic questions that haven't even been addressed yet. I mean, the, the one thing that I presented at a conference where we met is the, 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 to me it's like one of the most basic questions like losses and gains how that influences the whole thing and yeah, yeah. it hadn't really yeah. it hadn't and really uh, done equally probably. I feel like the prisoner's dilemma game has been done to death really <laughs> I feel like so many yeah. very very similar studies only very slight variations have been done and I think I think um well obviously we're going to talk about how I've transitioned away from this very sort of theoretical exactly. I was area. Just going to ask you <laughs> in in a moment if it's such but a I good think game, why are you yeah, yeah I think I think what I would argue for now is actually instead of just focusing on one particular theoretical game is actually to make them more applicable to real world decision contexts and ensure that you know they're mapped more closely to existing factors or real world factors and take those into account to actually model specific contexts and um, address specific research con- uh, research questions rather than stay very generalizable, if that makes sense. So, um, yeah, obviously I've, I've become a lot more applied in my work. Yeah. I mean, is um, to maybe then start, start moving towards <laughs> <laughs> your current research, did you... Um... I mean, so there, there was this like this theoretical paper about antimicrobial resistance from Andrew Coleman and uh, the lab, including you. I think during your PhD that came out or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah, I was already so I was still not quite finished with my PhD, and I was um, already working as a postdoc on my next project. And really, the project um, 
I mean, some people see it as a leap from going from game theory to antimicrobial resistance, but the entire time and the project that I worked in was really drawing on the theoretical principles of game theory. So it was always, you know, using my knowledge on social dilemmas that I gained throughout my PhD and then apply it to a very specific real world problem that is antimicrobial resistance. So yes, there was a bit of a change, obviously, and there was a, in a way, I've, I've become a lot more applied in my work and I've moved into health-related decision-making, but I've really applied all those principles that I've learned about and studied uh, throughout my PhD. So I don't think it's it's all that unrelated. It's just that I've moved away from the very specific centipede game context to wider games uh, and, and, and wider <laughs> wider decision context i guess to, to an actual real world <laughs> exactly real yeah. world context <laughs> um so maybe we've we've mentioned antimicrobial resistance a few times now um you wrote a uh, kind of almost more of a commentary um paper saying that uh, the name isn't good and we should change it and get a new name absolutely uh, so what exactly is the problem with the beautiful term antimicrobial resistance oh i hate that word honestly <laughs> i think when i first started out with my research i just i literally stumbled across it every single time i tried to pronounce it i still struggle with it and you know at the conference where we met actually one one colleague came up um i won't i won't name him here <laughs> it was <laughs> <Yeah>. a him <laughs> But he did say, you're doing such interesting stuff on antimicrobial resistance. I really admire it. I think it's so important. But man, I would never attempt to go into this field of research because I simply can't say it. <laughs> yeah. you, you just can't talk about it. I think it's just not a nice term to be to be using. It's not very, you know, it, it's very hard to pronounce. It, it sounds very abstract. Uh, it's, it's a long word. Um, it's difficult to translate into different languages. There's a whole host of issues. And um, maybe since we are talking about it, I don't know, does it, would it be helpful to actually define, tell the, the listeners what antimicrobial resistance Yeah, I was going to say, is? can we maybe actually say what we're talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this very complicated word is actually uh, refers to a biomedical problem, um, namely that uh, bacteria become resistant to the available, uh, to current drugs or, or medication that currently exists. Now, this is a natural process, so it would happen anyway, but any use of um, antibiotics kind of accelerates that process. So the more antibiotics we use, basically, the more uh, bacteria become resistant, so the stronger they get, basically, and they, the more able they become to withstand current treatment. Now, the kind of consequence of that is that as antimicrobial resistance progresses, more and more infections or bacteria infections become untreatable because the drugs no longer work. And that is a massive issue. So it's, it's a major global health threat because <laughs> we can start dying again from very simple infect infections that were uncurable before the discovery of antibiotics. So penicillin, the first antibiotic, was discovered in the 1920s. And before that, you know, people were dying from cuts, from simple bacteria infections. And, uh, you know, we could regress to a state of, similar to that, potentially, if all antibiotics stopped working. In addition to that, I think something that people don't realize is quite how often antibiotics are really used. So it's not just for those, you know, acute infection when someone comes in and they have a bad cut or they, they've caught pneumonia, but they're used in a whole lot of different settings, for example, for elective surgeries. So if someone has a hip surgery, you know, you give them antibiotics to prevent infection. And it will be extremely difficult, it will be extremely risky to conduct a, a surgery without antibiotics, having antibiotics on, on, you know, as a backup, basically, because otherwise they might just die from infection afterwards so you might have fixed the problem they came in with but then they get an infection and die from that but similarly they're used in conditions um, for example during cancer treatment when people are immunocompromised so they are not as you know they are not as able to fight off bacteria as usual so they are kind of longer term antibiotics just to help support their immune system so basically antibiotics are used across a wide range of different areas in healthcare, and if we lost working, functioning antibiotics, it really would have very, very damaging and dire consequences. I mean, it, it sounds like basically the consequence would be like that in specific cases, you would, we, yeah, we'd basically lose large parts of modern medicine. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you'd, you'd still have obviously some apparatus around it and other ways to deal with stuff. But yeah, it sounds like basically you're just like, you know, it's like, oh, this disease now, we're back to... To, yeah. to square one, whatever. basically. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And uh, people have compared it to kind of returning to the Middle Ages almost. 
I mean, obviously, we don't really know at what point we'll get there. So it's it's really hard to sort of quantify and predict and, and you know, make forecasts. And obviously, there is ongoing biomedical research looking at potential new treatments. So trying to find new antibiotics or trying to find alternative options. So they're experimenting with phages, which are sort of deactivated, deactivated viruses that can attack bacteria. But a lot of that work is in its infancy and a lot of the work specifically looking into the development of new antibiotics has actually not really been successful in the past. So there haven't been many new drugs on the market in a long time. And part of that actually is that it's simply not very a lucrative market or a lucrative business because antibiotics on the whole are quite cheap. So pharmaceutical companies don't really invest in the development or drug testing rate, basically, of those types of medication. So the whole host of issues, but basically it's, it's, at the moment it looks like we won't have working antibiotics by like 2050, basically. So that's when, when, um, economic forecasts predict, uh, for antimicrobial resistance or related infections, basically, to overtake cancer as a leading cause of death. And uh, it's not looking good, in summary. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, I guess the the whole point of your research then is to, you know, not from the biomedical side solve the problem, but rather from the, the side of how can we use less or is, is that a good summary? Or? Absolutely, yeah. So... I think antimicrobial resistance is obviously not a new topic and it has been studied widely and discussed widely in sort of niche areas uh, such as microbiology, which is obviously the, you know, the kind of area where it comes from and a lot of medics are aware of it. But I think it is essentially a behavioral problem because if we can't produce new treatments, new drugs, basically, we have to be able to manage the existing ones. And that's really the, the kind of, the kind of work that I'm interested in, the topic that I'm interested in. How we can we, manage the resource of effective antibiotics using the knowledge from psychology and from game theory and behavioral economics as well. Um, and so I want to talk a bit more about that, but I have just one back to the name just very briefly. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, so first of all, uh, these are kind of uh, two related questions. The first is, what are some good suggestions for this name? And secondly, so I always name the episode of my podcast with the name of the guest. And then I have like the three main topics we talked about. Mm -hmm. What should I put for this one? Should I put antimicrobial <laughs> resistance? Or is there a, a better word I can use for that? Oh, excellent question. So I've recently, I've done a survey study that's not actually quite published yet. I'm in the kind of last stages of writing up the manuscript. But that entire study focuses on the name of antimicrobial resistance. And... Um, I guess previously that one of the things um, that's wrong with the term that I haven't mentioned yet is actually that there are a lot of variants of the of the term. So there are different terms that are used interchangeably almost to describe the same thing. So in addition to antimicrobial resistance, there is a slightly similar related concept of antibiotic resistance, which is slightly different, but a lot of people don't know the difference. And so it's confusing. In addition to that, people use the terms of bacterial resistance, drug resistant infections, or superbugs, which specifically refers to very powerful, very super resistant bacteria, basically. So there's a whole host of different names out there, firstly. So in that study that I mentioned, I actually compared those names and uh, compared perceptions of, of lay people of those names. Um, and then again, looked at those compared to other risk uh, um, and health risk terminology, other health risks such as cancer, uh, Ebola, basically other, other other risk terms to kind of look at how effective the antimicrobial resistance terms are compared to other health risks, other threats that there are. And I found that all the terms to do with AMR, with antimicrobial resistance, were extremely difficult to remember for people. So they found it very difficult to recall them, to actively recall them or even passively recognize them when they were kind of presented with it afterwards. They also didn't seem to think, just looking at the word, that it was a health risk. So they didn't associate it, a threat with it. Whereas if they saw that the term... good, right? <laughs> resistance. Oh, yeah, I've got some resistance. Exactly, exactly. How would you know that that's something to be worried about? So if you see that term in the media, you know, then it doesn't actually spark any... It doesn't cause any alarm. It doesn't signal alarm. Whereas... um I guess other other things such as heart disease, it's very specific. You know it's about the heart, so you can imagine it's a, it's a big deal. Obviously, coronavirus disease, COVID has been in the media as well, so it's slightly confounded. But basically, other terms are, are doing much better in um, suggesting that there is a, a substantial risk or threat. 
So basically, uh, what I found in that study is that all the existing terms are pretty bad. And you ask what we should, uh, what we should actually name exactly. it instead. <laughs> You know what? I've been doing so much thinking about that. So some researchers have suggested to use the term drug-resistant infections, which is an existing term. And they say it has got the advantage that it's got infections in the title. So, you know, thereby signaling, signaling um, a health risk. So it, it's, it's a bit more concrete than perhaps antimicrobial resistance. But I did find in my study that it's one of the terms that's probably the least memorable, simply because it's a very long one and it's, it's complicated to spell, I guess. So I'm really not sure that's the way forward. I think um, there needs to be a specific, actually, a new study to really purposefully design a new name. And um, I'm specifically thinking about recent examples in this, because um, if you maybe remember uh, the, the kind of beginnings of COVID-19, it was initially initially referred to as the novel Chinese Wuhan coronavirus disease. So it had a very sort of stigmatizing title. And for that reason, it all kind of came together, <laughs> the big kind of political heads to kind of create a new name, and that was COVID-19. Um, obviously, they kind of did it for a slightly different reason, because they wanted to remove the stigma from the name. But I think a similar sort of a similar effort needs to be done in, in terms of antimicrobial resistance. So, you know, there needs to be some sort of um, agreement amongst political leads that there is a, is a need for change in, in the name. And then there needs to be that international buy-in as well. So I think, yeah, there needs to be, a like I said, there needs to be that buy-in, potentially like a, a research study with sort of political input as well because me saying you know i think this term should be <laughs> should be used from now on is not going to cut it i mean if you've got a good term maybe i've got time. i've got some ideas but i'm actually i'm actually uh, thinking about a potential study like this so i'm not going to give those away just yet <laughs> okay okay that might be one of yeah. my next projects so <laughs> but it, it sounds like this is really like a uh, um uh, the, it's almost like the WHO or something should hire a market research company or something. Pretty to, much. I think it needs really to be really high level way. to really make an impact. And, um, you know, they need to consult infectious disease people. They need to consult some some linguists as well who can, you know, you, you can advise on the, on the specific linguistic dimensions that are going to matter, that, such as pronounceability or um, concreteness or familiarity and so on. Because there are a few linguistic dimensions that have been shown to promote memorability in words, for example. So I think it needs to be a sort of a team effort, including a high level buy-in from political leaders, as well as research input from different disciplines. Okay. It's not going to be an easy fix, unfortunately, I don't think. Yeah, and you didn't answer my question, what I should put in the title. I guess I just have to put antimicrobial <laughs> I think, resistance. I think then. stick with that one. Um, I think, to be honest, okay. it's going, always going to be the term that is used in uh, science. Because it is the most okay. um, probably Specific yes or... yeah it's probably the most accurate term, and uh, for that reason I, I would say it's probably fine for academic use because we know what it what it describes it's just not pop it's just not a, a suitable term for public health communication so I would differentiate between those two areas of use. Uh, okay. Okay. Good. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I think then I, then I can just use that. <laughs> um, it's funny that you mentioned like it's not memorable because I kept looking at the way I typed it up in my notes and it keeps it looks like I mistyped it. But there I think you it's go. <laughs> it's like every time I look at it, it's like, did I spell this correctly or not? Exactly. Not sure. I, exactly. Yeah. I think it's just really not suitable. It's yeah. Yeah. OK. Anyway, that's the term we're using right now. <laughs> uh, I guess we can use AMR if you want to make it. Uh, in, in general, I don't really like abbreviations too I much. I don't either, usually... yeah. So I did a search for AMR previously, and it stands for a whole lot of other things. So again, it's not really that useful. Again, it, it's really common in a science background. But yeah, if you use it for kind of wider population, or people who have not heard the beginning of this podcast, <laughs> it's probably not that yeah. useful. <laughs> Yeah, but I guess this is, is a continuous podcast, so people who will listen to the later part will probably listen to this part. I, would so hope I guess so. uh, from I guess we can call it AMR. Uh, just briefly about the, so the actual problem of AMR itself is then uh, I guess I just want to define that a little bit more. I mean, you mentioned some problem areas already, like how it comes about. I uh, one thing you didn't mention, which I thought I don't know where I got this from, but I thought that was also a huge problem, is just. Uh, the meat industry, so um, cows or whatever, just or chickens or whatever, being regularly just given, or not even regularly, just like always given 
uh, the stuff that are, is that correct? Yeah, completely um, agree. So um, that's true. So we talk about a one health approach, which means um, antibiotic use is not just a problem in, in human health care. It's also a problem in animal health and in the environment. So it's, it's used for uh, to promote uh, to promote growth of animals, for example, um, in, in agriculture. And it's used in the environment sometimes. And it obviously, use in one area has a huge impact on the use in all other areas because <laughs> antibiotics, it doesn't matter, you know, to bacteria where antibiotics are used, uh, the resistance happens anyway. In my work at the moment, I mainly focus on the healthcare sector in, of human health, simply because it's not possible to study everything. <laughs> I completely agree that the other areas are important, maybe just as important. It is, it, yeah, it, it just, I, I don't have enough time to study everything. And, uh, <laughs> and I actually think also that uh, antibiotic use in human healthcare presents um, different ethical challenges or slightly different challenges compared to meat production, agriculture and, and animal health. Because whereas in agriculture, it's fairly clear cut. So, you know, it's very, fairly obvious that antibiotic use um, is, a, is a very selfish thing to be doing. It's an economic argument. Exactly. Right? It is a purely economic argument. Whereas I think the healthcare sector, healthcare overuse of antibiotics is, is more interesting because it is not simply based on uh, self, selfish motivations. It is influenced by a whole host of different um, variables, really. Lots and lots of different factors, a lot of psychological variables that really come into play. And uh, that's where I think the social dilemma sort of um, context is also the most applicable and the most interesting. So that's my reason for focusing on the, on the human healthcare sector. But I agree that there's a lot more to this issue and I agree that other people should be doing more work <laughs> on animal health as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's always the nice thing for people who want to do research. Here's an entire topic. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Throw yourself out. It's just it's just such a big big topic, honestly. It, it just warrants so much further research. And like I said, I'm only one one tiny part of this. I'm a behavioral scientist, a psychologist who looks into this. But like I said, you know, we need more input from um different sciences and it's actually really interesting to see how multidisciplinary the work has gotten so there is if people are interested in this there's actually a really interesting other podcast in addition to yours <laughs> that i sometimes what, follow <laughs> yes it's called the amr studio podcast i believe it's uh, hosted somewhere in sweden and um, they do really well in highlighting interdisciplinary contributions to the topic so we have all that biomedical research but then there's um there's research from, from the arts, for example, where they try to um, illustrate or visualize antimicrobial resistance or engage with people on different levels. So I would say, you know, there's, there's a whole range of different research areas out there. And if you're interested, there's lots of options to get involved <laughs> in really fascinating projects. Perfect. Um, you mentioned already the social dilemma aspect, and I think I guess that's kind of also why... I mean, I guess that's why I saw your talk at the conference. Um, and that's also the aspect I'm probably most interested in. So, um, yeah, maybe can you um, give a brief overview kind of what is or why or how is um, antimicrobial resistance a social dilemma? Um, yeah, maybe let's just start there and then kind of maybe contrast it, how it relates to other dilemmas. The one you, the talk you gave was in relation to climate change. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess a social dilemma scenario, let's let's define that to start with. So it's any situation really where the kind of individual interests of, of a single person are sort of at odds with the collective interests of, of overall society. So um, the sort of theoretical, typical example that's usually given is uh, that of um, the researcher Hardin. So he kind of coined the term of a, a public dilemma game or a public goods game. Uh, the tragedy of the commons, which are all very related. And basically, it presumes that there is a common, a good, um, a commons, such as a public meadow, that's a typical example. And this good can be used by lots of different people. So in the common example, there are lots of neighboring sort of farmers that send their sheep to graze on the meadow, and obviously benefits everybody because they get free food for their sheep. But then the more sheep they send, Obviously, the, the farmers are getting more out of it, but the more they send also, uh, the more the meadow becomes degraded. So if everybody kind of does the same and acts in their own best interest, that means the common good gets depleted. And in the end, nobody um, benefits from it or all of them actually suffer as a result. So the same underlying structure, I believe, applies to the decision making dilemma of antibiotic resistance. So if we, in this context, believe or conceptualize 
um, antibiotic efficacy as the c- common good. So um, we're interested in preserving effective drugs, basically. Effective drugs that can kill bacteria infections, that can treat bac- bacteria infections and maintain our healthcare system as it is. So that's the common good. And um, all of us use antibiotics. Well, not all of us, but a lot of people use antibiotics on a, on a sort of regular basis. And some of that use, you know, is probably tolerable or appropriate, I would say. Tolerable is probably the wrong word, but appropriate uh, given the circumstances. So a lot of people would argue that, you know, if you're almost, if you're close to dying from a, from an infection, then it's appropriate to use an antibiotic. But then in other circumstances, antibiotics are overused. So they're used when it's maybe not necessary or when it's completely inappropriate because they are not medically indicated. And um, all that overuse basically contributes to a depletion of the common good that is drug efficacy. Because like I said initially, you know, the more we use antibiotics, the more we um, contribute to antimicrobial resistance. So the, the more we deplete the working drugs that are available. And uh, as a result, you know, it might serve individuals on a, on a kind of, on their own basis. Because if someone overprescribes or overuses antibiotics, it is often motivated by, um, by a wish to um, avoid health risk. So usually there is maybe a suspected infection and they use antibiotics just in case. Obviously, um, there's usually a motivation behind this and, and presumably it's a selfish one, actually. So um, all that kind of selfish overuse then leads to a depletion of the, the public good, the common good that uh, will affect everybody and have really bad consequences for the for future generations of people. So that's the social dilemma. Yeah, and I guess yeah, I guess it is. I mean, you mentioned this in one of your articles. That um, by the way, for anyone new to the podcast, I always put like references and links to stuff we discuss in the description, so you don't have to look for the papers. Um, I guess the interesting thing that you you mentioned how antimicrobial resistance is a kind is a is an interesting social dilemma that differs from some other examples is that it's not just purely selfish, right? So there might be. I don't think I don't know whether you mentioned this example, um, but like you know, you could also ask a doctor to prescribe it for your parents exactly. or whatever who are maybe ill, exactly, right, or for yeah. other people you're caring for. Um, or the example you give there is that doctors do it because they want their patients to be healthy. Um, and you know, what is one? Uh, um, you know, what is what? What I'm looking for. Well, it's, I guess what you get trying to get at is what's a single contribution to the wider problem, really. Is that what you're... Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just like one, you know, this is not going to... Yeah, this is not going to make the difference. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. So, like I said, I don't think this is a dilemma which is black and white. So, there's not one move that is cooperation and one move that is defection. And, you know, you were already asking about differences between social dilemmas. So, I think that's how it differs from a lot of the theoretic, theoretical models that we've got where one move is always a bad one and one move is always the good one. I don't think that is the case in, in the context of antibiotic use in healthcare. I think it is just so much more complicated. And yeah, one of the motivations is definitely to help other people. So as doctors who are usually the gatekeepers of antibiotic because they prescribe them for others, you know, they um, obviously, obviously they've kind of sworn an oath, they've taken an oath and um, they are committed to protecting their patients. And a lot of it comes down really to their risk aversion. So in some circumstances, you know, they might not need antibiotics, the patient might not need antibiotics, but it's simply not clear. Um, We speak of clinical uncertainty in those cases. So sometimes the patient might present with symptoms of a bacterial infection, but it's not clear if they really have one or if it's something completely different. Or it's also not clear if maybe that infection will clear by itself. So there are certain so so called self limiting diseases that will just get better over time so in those cases antibiotics aren't necessary or maybe it's actually a completely a different thing you know it's not a bacterial infection at all and antibiotics aren't going to help anyway so in those cases prescribing is inappropriate now um i would argue that even though there's maybe a selfish factor to it because Doctors want to maybe cover their own back and they want to make sure that patients don't come back and complain about, you know, the treatment they've received. Quite often their decision making is motivated by risk aversion and by their general wish to help the patient in front of them. 
So their kind of concern is obviously for the immediate need right in front of them rather than for future generations of patients that they might not actually get to see after all. So um, again, a difference here that I'd like to outline compared, you know, comparing antimicrobial resistance to more standard models is just that we have that sort of temporal distance here. So a lot of it is actually in the future still. Antibiotic resistance is here to some extent, but to the to the extent where we actually really see the the kind of the impacts and the consequences, that is probably only only going to happen in, in, in a few decades, basically. Because at the moment, we usually have a backup antibiotic ready that will still work if the first one doesn't. So it's 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 complicated by the factor that you know it's not an immediate sort of outcome. Antimicrobial resistance is something that's going to happen over time. That's not necessarily visible immediately, and that is quite difficult to grasp. So lots of complicating factors going on. Is there um, from a from a like scientific experimental or yeah even theoretical side? Are there any like really good models of this or experiments you can do? Or is it the kind of thing where you feel like, I don't know, you want to do a study on this to not, you know, use the exact context, but to generalize a little bit. And then there's just nothing you can really use. Um, yeah, I'm curious, like, is there, what is the best model maybe to study this? And how, how good of a approximation is it to the actual thing? Yeah, so um, I'm glad you're asking because I've, I've got a study in preparation actually on this. So I'm involved in study. Oh, really? okay. This wasn't driven by myself, I have to say. I was approached um, by a very talented PhD student from the Copenhagen lab. And um, she's done some really fascinating work where she put a lot of effort in into, um, organ into designing what is essentially a public goods game with lots of... Um, adjusting variables, basically, lots of different factors that kind of make it more similar to antibiotic resistance. And um, I, I think maybe once it's out, uh, you can add it to, <laughs> to, the, <laughs> okay. to the list of links and, and references. But I think there is a way to model it. It's just um, to take into account complicating factors and, uh, yeah, and, and kind of, yeah, different variables that are slightly different. In, in so like adding the time horizon aspect. Exactly, yeah. These kind yeah, of things. Yeah. Well. And adding also the, the kind of uncertainty. So one element that we wanted to capture was that, you know, at some point it might seem rational to take antibiotics, but actually it's not. And sometimes it's just about waiting and seeing how things develop. Because it might appear rational to overuse antibiotics when you're very sick, but actually every use of antibiotics also has certain side effects. Like any medication, you know, you can get a really bad uh, stomach upset. We, we've heard a lot more about you know, how important the microbiome is for um, for mental health and then uh, just general well-being. And all of that is really badly damaged by, by use of antibiotics. So there are also negative side effects that are often sort of almost neglected neglected and forgotten about. So we try to model those in actually in, in the game that we've um, come up with in the end, because sometimes just waiting and seeing how things develop and monitoring symptoms can be the most appropriate way forward because you don't want to use antibiotics when they're really not necessary. Okay, sounds like a good study. It definitely is. We'll <laughs> wait until that's out. <laughs> how much research has actually been done on the reasons for people over prescribing, oh no, not even over prescribing per se, but just prescribing them in the first place. I mean, you mentioned some aspects like uncertainty. That kind of, is, is that, I'm asking because I just don't know the field at all. Has there been like a lot, a lot of this where they ask doctors specifically examples? Yeah, no, there or? has been a bulk of research, mainly by the medical professions, to be honest. It's not really kind of informed by psychology, but there has been a lot of work. Some of it actually also produced by us. Um, so my, my kind of my own research group. So I was involved in a project. This was when I was a postdoc, actually, that um, used qualitative methods interviewing um, to ask doctors for their reasons of overprescribing or generally prescribing antibiotics. And I think the reason why there are a lot of studies and why there need to be a lot of studies is because this vastly or massively depends on the context. It is a really contextualized issue. Um, it depends massively on the healthcare context. So the study that we conducted was one um, taking place across the UK, South Africa and Sri Lanka. And what we found is, for example, in Sri Lanka, they have, firstly, obviously, they have much lower hygiene and sanitation um, uh, throughout. So generally higher infection rates, making uh, meaning that actually antibiotics are even more important than perhaps uh, in the UK. But we also noted that it was um, very heavily influenced by a large private sector. And obviously, there is a, then a really big disconnect between private and public. And in, in the private sector, 
the, the main difference is obviously that patients come in and pay for a service. So um, patients play a much more central role in those contexts. And it's not just about the prescriber. It is about the kind of patient prescriber interaction. And if a patient who's paying to receive a service and who's then afterwards rating the hospital, perhaps on a, you know, a public site, who, who's, if the patient, if that patient is demanding antibiotics based on sort of misguided beliefs, then the doctor will prescribe antibiotics, even if they don't believe they're indicated. So I think it's, it's a topic that massively depends on the context and the, the kind of system that they're, you know, surrounded by, which is why a lot of contextualized studies actually need to take place. And I do actually believe that also qualitative studies have their place there. So um, maybe you notice I kind of moved away from purely experimental methods here and I became involved in more qualitative work. I do think that they're really valuable for outlining or for kind of highlighting very nuanced um, kind of motives, motivations that otherwise would not be able to um, to be pinpointed. Yes, it's funny to me, like the qualitative kinds of studies, because I mean, I've never done one. I don't. I don't know whether anyone I've worked with has ever ever done one. Um, I've read. I mean, I've read one qualitative study, which to me, to be fair, seemed more like maybe the reason why you wouldn't. Use it. <laughs> it very kind of. I don't know. It seemed. I guess I just wanted to talk a, bit, a little bit about this because it's. I am wondering, like, what. Yeah, what the specific use of qualitative studies is and how it can help in ways that quantitative can't. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, like what specific kind of, um, yeah, why, why did you use a qualitative study, um, and not a quantitative one? And what did you kind of hope to get out of for this specific study? Or? So I guess I like to take kind of novel approaches to things that have been studied in the past. Actually, my first sort of dab into, stab into, um, qualitative methods was during my PhD, was during the kind of centipede work, because I have one study where I um, investigated centipede reasoning, reasoning in centipede games, decision making in those games, <laughs> um, using um, verbal protocol analysis. So that involves having people talk aloud while they're making decisions. And it was a very small scale study, as is very common for qualitative studies. So I only had about 12 participants, I think. But the amount of data, the, the, the wealth and richness of the data that I received was really mind boggling. I had not, I have really not anticipated to get that much out of it. So I have to say at heart, I'm probably also an experimentalist, a quant, quant person. And I was uh, similarly, um, I don't know, quali qualitative stuff was always a bit suspect to me. But after that one, um, kind of attempt or that, that, you know, that one venture into qualitative work, I just realized that I guess it's got a really sort of exploratory function. So it can sort of um, help you to define research questions by just let, helping you to take stock of what is out there and just really exploring the breadth and depth of everything that might be underlying a problem. And then, you know, once you've kind of singled out a few key motives, you can then sort of hone in on those with experimental methods. I do, I do think in my mind, quantitative and qualitative work should always go together. So I'm, I'm really a big fan of mixed methods. And um, maybe to answer your um, question of why we use qualitative and interview studies in that context of of uh, antibiotic prescribing, again, it comes down to just getting those nuances and then and really, you know, not coming in with a preconceived mind. So obviously, you know, when you design an experimental study, you have to manipulate certain variables. So you have to know which ones to manipulate. You have to know which ones you're going to look at. Whereas with an interview study, you go in, almost not blind, you have obviously a knowledge of the topic area and you ask certain, certain sort of structured questions, but you're just a lot more open to receiving new input, I would say. And um, especially with it being such a complex topic, comparing motives for overprescribing across different contexts, cultural context um, and so on, it just wouldn't have been possible to do that in a quantitative design. What you could do is, you know, collect data and then compare prescribing levels, but that wouldn't tell you much about why they're overprescribed yeah, necessarily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny that I only thought about this whilst you were giving your answers, that the the, the very first kind of prison cinema study by uh, um, Merrill and Flood, whoever it was, like the before it was even called prison cinema, yeah, that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that one actually, um, you know, he just had like a the kind of the payoff matrix design and then let them play like 
a hundred rounds or something like that. It's funny, that one actually includes in the appendix a transcript of what one of the people said. And it's really interesting to read because this one person kept saying like, uh, you know, like, come on, doesn't like, why is he defecting? Doesn't he realize we can get more if we cooperate? And, so and you could really see like all these motives play out when he was at some point. He's like, OK, I'm going to defect now because, you know, uh, I'm not going to like be the sucker every time. But and then occasionally he was like, OK. But like I have to remind him that this is important. <laughs> like, and I have to like train, teach him like that mutual cooperation is the best. It is, honestly, it's fascinating. So like I said, that that verbal protocol study on centipede games, it just came up. I mean, the things that you mentioned here. I mean, that at least they're not they're kind of rational. Well, I suppose they they make sense those comments. But I had some comments that are almost unsensical or nonsensical. So people were having the weirdest motives for making moves in the game. And, uh, you know, I had initially done a comprehension test, so it's not like they didn't get the game. But some of them were, for example, arguing like, oh, I'm just going to go, for, I'm just going to keep continuing now. I just want to feel like I get to the end, just so that I feel like I finished. You know, things like that, that weren't actually related to the payoffs at all. It was simply, you know, sort of a weird action bias that they just wanted to feel like they've gone all the way in a sequential game. And things like that, I think, as an experimenter, you wouldn't even, you would never come up with just because you can't imagine the sort of weird things that this sounds, this sounds negative no. now. I'm not, I mean, I'm not judging people because it's obviously a very sort of theoretical context and everybody looks at it very differently. But all I'm saying is as an individual, you can't really anticipate what other people are going to think of it, especially someone who's really not trained in those methods and who's never seen a game before. To them, it's, it's something entirely different. So. Yeah, I mean, that's why I really like talking to participants after the experiment. I mean, we did one, you know, set of iterated prisoner cinema tasks. And I mean, I didn't actually talk to this person directly and figure it out, but kind of indirectly, because I saw this one person always cooperated every single time. And there was in particular one interaction where the other person always defected. So there was like, you know, 50 trials in a row, one person cooperated, the other defected every single time. Like, the, like yeah, one guy yeah. was making so much money off of the other person. And um, so I, I, you know, I just thought oh, maybe the person didn't understand the task or whatever. Anyway, so then I remembered, uh, so the, the person, so there was one participant who was, let's say, um, visually recognizable, um, who took part in lots of studies at the Institute. And then one person said, oh, this like, person came in and uh, just told me like that, they found Jesus and um, always want to be nice to people and forgive them all <laughs> exactly, kind of stuff. And yeah. then I realized that, that was, was that, that one person. I, I looked it up. It was exactly that one person who always forgave basically <laughs> the other person. Wow, it's like, wow. that's not part of like your experimental design. Exactly. That you get exactly. There's who... just so many motives that can't be captured with constructs such as such social value orientation. You know, there's just no measure for it, and you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to to conceive of it. So yeah, no, I mean yeah. Since you mentioned the repeated prisoner dilemma game, we had a study where we ran 300 prisoner dilemma games, and it was a really really long study. And just seeing how the emotions played out in the room. Obviously, they couldn't see each other, but then some of the emotional yeah. reactions people were you know using swear words and getting really <laughs> aggravated and yeah it's it's really fascinating and then equally I, I agree it's really valuable talking to participants afterwards so one time I had a participant who said well I just don't believe that you're going to give me the money afterwards they just they had been deceived in a previous experiment or I had made a bad you know bad experience and they just simply didn't believe that they were going to get any money so they just kind of made random choices so again something that you know I guess you could put it down as noise in the experiment but it's something that you can't factor in really and unless you explore it in a different way. I guess the economists listening to this are very pleased with themselves right now, <laughs> because that's exactly why they don't allow. I know, I know. Um, I need to say, yeah, right? they're quite. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so, so so are you in a way then using a qualitative study almost in the way that I informally usually talk for potentially, like a yeah, or two, yeah. But like, I don't, you know, because this is not part of the experiment. I don't like do it for five to ten minutes or something, right? I just kind of like ask them often like what they thought about the experiment or whatever. And so is this kind of a more formalized, um, I guess you can, you can more see systematic it like that. way yeah. of doing yeah, the same yeah. thing? It's a, it's a systematic way. I think um, obviously you factor it in from the beginning. Uh, sometimes you even use it to potentially then inform the design of an experiment afterwards. Uh, but I, I think, yeah, it sounds like you're doing it at some level already. It's just about actually recognizing that this is a but really important much step. Much less. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. It is a really important step and it can be really valuable. But I agree that the kind of analysis is always a bit of a nightmare. So I, I understand people not wanting to <laughs> dive into it. <laughs> it, is, it is challenging. 
Yeah. I mean, that's one thing I always lack with online studies. So, you know, I, I, I mean, online studies are fantastic. Right? You can collect hundreds <laughs> so of people in, in like an I hour. Know, it's, I know. Oh, you can just sit there and just watch, watch the, the data, data come in. in. It's, <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. It's like Christmas but Day yeah, you and you can just download this. it all in one file. And <laughs> yeah. And then see your experiment didn't work yeah, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but the, you know, I, I really loved, you know, that's, I mean, it's fantastic, right? But yeah, you do always have the sense of like, did, Did they, they really get, get it? it? I mean, I, they, I do yeah. leave like an open like comment thing at the end. And sometimes you get people who say like, I didn't get it. But, I mean, I have test questions, so I, I usually know if they understood it or not. But yeah. When they're do doing other kind of stuff this. at the same time, I think it's just, it, it does lack a sort of, yeah. You, you, <laughs> it is difficult to know what they were thinking at the time. It is difficult. And, and you know, I mean, I like the idea of having a comments box, but then, you know, it takes a certain amount of effort or, or even willingness to to then fill that in if it's not a required sort of uh, part of the study. So it, it does depend on the person's motivation and yeah, a lot of people. I think I think it does depend a bit on the on the survey provider or the, the kind of the online site that you're using as a host. Basically, the quality of the data that you get. But I'm sure you're aware of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, for me, it's the. Uh, most important thing is, you know, lots of test questions and then beginning to make sure they understand everything. And yeah, um, back to, uh, uh, I guess we have to uh, finish at some point, <laughs> uh, just briefly about antimicrobial resistance, which still looks as if I mistyped it. Um, yeah, it's a weird looking word. Yeah, I guess I'm just curious about like, uh, in general, like, okay, so we, you know, it's this huge problem and what can we do about it? And maybe to ask us a question that relates to something you mentioned earlier with poorer countries having um, less sanitation on average and therefore needing more. I'm curious, is maybe the, one of the you know best ways to solve this to just, in, uh, just in quotation marks, uh, increase sanitation in poorer countries? Is that kind of the main yes, way? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, I think sometimes you can see nice overviews. There's really a multifaceted way of approaching it. So it is it is partly of um, improving sanitation. and So making sure that infections don't arrive in the first place because you don't have an infection, then you don't need to treat it and you don't need to need to use any drugs. So yeah, absolutely. But um, it's, it's unfortunately, it's not as easy as that because it's obviously not possible to eradicate all infections. <laughs> what you need to do is, like you said, improve sanitation, improve infection control. So make sure that infections don't spread. If someone has got an infection, make sure you know it's contained within that person rather than spreading it onto others. Um, but that's definitely one part of the one part of the uh, challenge, I guess. Um, additional parts are obviously looking at more. Um, drug development, but also looking at best, uh, better diagnostic tests. So one issue is um, that. You know, I mentioned the clinical uncertainty. One issue is that doctors often don't know what they've got, um, what, what, the, what the patient in front of them has got. So there is that clinical uncertainty, which then leads to what we call empirical prescribing. So it's basically prescribing on a hunch or an experience, basically just going on the symptoms alone and going on the, you know, going by the experience of that of that doctor in question. And that can be a very, very challenging task. You know, often there are um, other factors that are going on time pressure. So you don't have a lot of time to really fully investigate. And um, this is actually a new study that I'm going to get involved in, which is a really more clinically applied study. But we are looking at um, current diagnostic tests, which are conducted using blood samples. So at the moment, you know, we do have microbiology lab tests that can firstly determine whether it is actually a bacteria infection and then also what type of bacterial infection it is. So, you know, which specific antibiotic can we use to target more narrowly, you know, more specifically this particular infection. So we do have those tests, but at the moment, um, blood samples aren't always taken reliably. So part of that reason is that people are so so much under time pressure or the patient looks so ill that they give antibiotics straight away and then it's too late to collect blood samples. But then also, they don't actually think there's much use to it because the results sometimes come back three to four days after. And sometimes they don't benefit the the initial prescriber, the one who made the initial prescription, they benefit someone else down the line. So again, actually, it's a mini social dilemma in the sense that you're having to do something that potentially is a bit time consuming because taking a blood sample in a busy environment when you could be doing other things is not always easy. So it involves some effort that, you know, benefits someone else because there are you know, other prescribers, other doctors, the patient is going to see. So you might not actually ever get to see the benefit of this action. 
So I think a lot of the the work really needs to focus on providing better diagnostic tests and maybe incentivizing running those diagnostic tests in the first place and really eliminating that large level of diagnostic uncertainty, which then leads to overprescribing and overuse of antibiotics. So, yeah, lots of different factors that come together. Like you said, you know, hygiene, sanitation is one of them. Um, and then other sort of behavioral um, aspects as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, 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 the cool thing about this seems to be that there's lots of different ways of addressing this problem. I and mean, I guess, or, you know, I guess it's about at least limiting it. Not, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Completely avoiding exactly, it, but yeah. making sure that, you know, there's at least a few. <laughs> lots of different angles that, that you can work. take, lots of different perspectives. Yeah. So obviously my work on kind of terminology and so on, that's a different angle in it altogether as well, because it's all about how we communicate a risk and how we, you know, how we talk about it in the public domain and how we even draw attention to a problem. So again, that kind of goes into... Well, I suppose it's obviously it's meant to address overuse of antibiotics, but it is actually through a sort of information intervention, so to speak. So again, it's it's another it's another facet, I suppose, that comes in to the management. Yeah, I mean, is uh, just a, a kind of as a last point. I mean, I um, you know I talked to um, one of my earlier interviews was, was with Hannah Watkins, who's part of the Nudge Unit in the Australian government. And uh, she mentioned it like as a just as an example of the kind of thing they did there that they were doing something on. Um, uh, I think in that case they the study's probably out by now actually. I think they 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 basically you know they know how many antibiotics each doctor is prescribing, so they just sent a letter out to the to the main the people who really overprescribed and said like hey there are, you know probably there are many good reasons why you might overprescribe right but uh just to let you know by the way you are one of the people who's really driving this or who's yeah it's uh, a clear social norm not, that word, not but, that, yeah it, exactly and i think they said that worked quite well is there lots of stuff like that being done in all sorts of countries or yeah so that that um study i think it's been in, done in a sort of different variations in different contexts. I definitely know of a, a couple of UK studies that have sort of replicated that finding. So nudging can be an effective way. I guess um, it's sometimes around the sustainability of those nudges. So, you know, once you stop the intervention, is it still going to to show, to prove effective afterwards? And I guess certain long-term changes maybe are hard to address with nudges because they, they really sort of um, boil down to very ingrained um yeah, ingrained types of behavior that maybe are just simply not that you can't rectify entirely with nudges, which in the end of the day, you know, obviously there are changes to environment. They're not um, obligatory in a way or man mandating any type of behavior, but in the way they're obviously small changes to the environment. I'm not sure that nudges alone will be able to solve the problem. I think they can be part of the puzzle. And again, this is probably where, where it comes back to that sort of multi, multi-prong. I think that's what they sometimes call it. You know, we have to go at it <laughs> lots of different ways. Nudges can be part of it, but I don't think they're going to save the issue entirely. Yeah, I mean, as you said, if, if people are just getting infected all the time, what are you going to do? Just let them die. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem like a good solution either. Yeah. And obviously, there's, there's another thing that, you know, if you compare different prescribers, it actually does, um, there is a case that um, the, the kind of caseload differs across different GP practices, for example. So in certain areas, you have a higher caseload of people with infection, so prescribing will have to be higher. And just generally punishing everybody for high prescribing levels can't also be the, the way forward, <laughs> because often there's actually a real need or a real reason for it. Yeah. And I guess that's part of why it's such a complicated problem, because it's not just, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> just I could probably talk about it for hours. Or... There's so many different aspects and then, yeah, and different dimensions to it. I think that makes it truly fascinating. Well, I guess... Um... If you can talk about it for hours, we just, you don't have the time <laughs> I'm not sure I really would want to listen so... to that. <laughs> yeah. It might get really boring um... after a while. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, is there, uh, is there anything else you want to add? <laughs> no, I really enjoyed the conversation, but yeah, you, you're right. I mean, I could go on for hours, but um, I'm not sure that will benefit the listeners necessarily. <laughs> 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 I think what I wanted okay. to bring across is that it really is a, a really um, complex field of research and that we as behavioral scientists have a really important role to play, which shouldn't be overlooked and more people should do it. <laughs> No, more people should get involved in this and, and realize that antibiotic resistance is 
a really important issue that I think sometimes is being overlooked compared to other issues such as climate change and uh, maybe biodiversity and so on. Obviously, those are important issues too. I just feel like, um, yeah, it's being overlooked and simply because it is not a very visible problem and it is a very abstract problem and some, something that is hard to understand and you probably need a bit of scientific knowledge for it, um, that means that we're not addressing it to the same extent that maybe other problems are being addressed.